You are listening to the Digital Parent Podcast with your host, Sed Lewis. Hey parents, welcome to another episode of the Digital Parent Podcast. On this episode, we tackle the subject of the first cell phone, meaning the first phone that you're going to buy for your child. We know like a lot of you guys have rising sixth graders, kids are going to be going to middle school next year, or maybe you have some elementary school kids that are going to fourth or fifth grade and you're getting ready to purchase that first cell phone, but you have that fear of sexting, bullying, or privacy being breached, and you don't know what to do. So in order to help you, we brought back our good friend, Dr. Devorah Heitner, who has a PhD in media and technology. And you remember from episode 34 of the Digital Parent Podcast, we talked about her best-selling book on Amazon called ScreenWise, where she really went in about empathy and teaching those skill sets to kids. And she had really applied that to this episode about how our kids still need to have those empathy skill sets when they have their first cell phone. But what I'm mostly excited about is that Devorah and I really discuss her new program, her new seminar called Cell Phone Boot Camp, Boot Camp for Parents. Cell Phone Boot Camp for Parents that goes through a laundry list of things that you can do right now to prepare your child for the first cell phone before you even go out and purchase that cell phone. So Devorah gives a lot of tips. She and I go back and forth on a lot of things that you can do, that you can apply right before you get the phone. So I hope that you really enjoy this episode with Devorah. Hey guys, before we jump into our interview with Devorah, I really want to make sure you go to the show notes for this episode and enroll in our new course on Udemy called The Ultimate Guide in Using Twitter to Land Scholarships. You will learn some of the following strategies. One, how to monitor scholarships in your area just by using Twitter. Two, how to engage college professors on Twitter and other kids who have won scholarships in your area. Three, create profiles to impress admission officers and scholarship committees, and you will learn much, much, much more. So make sure you check out our new Udemy course, Using Twitter to Land Scholarships, in our show notes following this episode. Now let's get to it with Devor. Hey, DeVore, welcome to another episode of the Digital Parent Podcast. We're so happy to have you on the show today. Thank you. It's great to be with you. Well, DeVore, we really want to invite you on to talk about, you know, parents purchasing cell phones. And we know you've just created this great course, the Cell Phone Boot Camp. And I think this is a good time because going into the summertime, we know there are going to be two things that are going to happen. One, a lot of kids are going to be going to camp. So, you know, there are going to be parents who are going to try to rush out and buy phones, for the kids that keep in contact with them, even though we know a lot of camps don't allow cell phones, but they're still going to try to sneak it. And then mm-hmm. second, you know, you have a lot of kids going back to school in the fall, some going to middle school, uh, and there are going to be parents who are going to be purchasing those phones so they can communicate with their kids throughout the school year. So we thought it'd be great to have you on the show to kind of, kind of help parents guide them through uh, those decisions. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Summer is a big time for a new device And there are reasons why it could be a great time because maybe for some families, parents may have a little more time to be mentoring kids and talking with kids. But it's also a time that's kind of upheaval, right? Like a lot of families, at least for me, there's always, you know, the end of school is always a little crazy. And then there's always those down times, you know, before camp and traveling and all those things. So it's also kind of a hectic time in some ways as a parent, whereas the school year, you know, we all have our routine. So right. Yeah, the school year gives you that structure. It's like when you're outside of school, it's kind of like, okay, what are we going to do with all this free time? Exactly. Now, one of the trends, you know, we're seeing, Devorah, is that we're seeing a lot of elementary school students have cell phones. And we're not even talking about fifth graders. We're talking about, like, first graders, second graders. And I'm assuming a lot of that has to do with, you know, there are a lot of, like, you know, cell phone plans are very reasonable now where it's easy to add, like, lines to your cell phone bill, and it doesn't cost a parent that much to add a new phone. But there's there's something that's there. I was wondering if you're seeing the same thing with there being an increase in the number of cell phones being purchased for younger kids. I'm seeing more hand-me-downs, at least in my own community, but I think that varies. You know, when I travel around the country and, and work with schools, I am hearing about fourth and fifth graders certainly getting a phone with a plan. Often when I see even younger kids with phones, it's not really an active phone. It's like, oh, I have my big brother's phone, but it only works, you know, if I'm in wireless, other things. But you certainly do see younger and younger kids getting phones. I mean, five or six years ago, we really only saw kids getting them in high school. And there's no question that 
there's a lot of nine and 10 and 11 and 12 year olds out there with phones now. And that's a huge shift. And yet the conversation about what we expect of kids with phones almost still seems like a high school conversation, but it's real different if you're in fourth or fifth grade, the expectations. And I think that's actually important because I think another conversation, you know, we say cell phones, but an iPhone or not an iPhone, but an iPod touch is the same thing as an iPhone, basically. Absolutely. And, and especially given that these kids do not call. I mean, that's one of the things that everywhere I go, you know, when I talk to parents and say, well, it does your kid have basic phone skills? Can they call someone on the phone? Most kids are very reluctant to do that. Even my college students, when I taught college, were very reluctant to get on the phone. So the main thing that phones do that an iPod touch or a tablet doesn't do is the thing that kids are the least interested in. Yeah, I think it's important for parents to understand. I mean, kids, I know my eight-year-old, she FaceTimes nonstop. She texts nonstop. So they're doing the same thing on an iPod touch that a kid would do on an iPhone. There's really no difference outside of the ability to make a phone call. And they still can make phone calls through Google Voice and other apps. So when you give your kid iPod touch, I think it's good for parents to understand is that you're still basically giving them a cell phone. That's true. I think one of the big differences is some parents will allow kids to use a tablet or a touch in the home where maybe there's a little bit more opportunity to supervise more casually just by being present, but they may not allow children to take those to school, whereas a lot of kids will take a phone to school and often it's around an independence milestone like walking to school on their own or taking transit to school more independently, that would be a time that some parents will say, okay, you need your own phone because that idea that your child wouldn't be able to reach you in that, you know, six to 10 blocks walking between home and school can really be concerning to some parents. And it's helpful to remember that you probably walked home from school without a mobile device. (laughs) Right. Uh, right. Unless you're, you know, there are some, you know, younger parents that may have had some kind of device or a pager, but for most of us, we were completely unplugged and disconnected when we were walking home from school. And, and yet we, were we we arrived safely yeah we survived mm-hmm. so we're going to assume that you know these parents are going to buy these phones so what's going to be like the top two challenges that they're going to have to face after they purchase that cell phone well one huge question is just are you going to allow kind of 24 7 access the way many adults live with our phones is that they're by our beds when we sleep so for a, a lot of parents it's very important to clarify with kids. Most parents don't plan for their children to have 24 seven access. That's a good conversation to have with the kids before you go to the cell phone store or before you surprise them with that phone, just so that they're prepared to think of the phone as something that they don't have constant access to. So whatever your plan is, you know, okay, you're going to check in this phone at eight o'clock or you're not going to have this phone when you're doing homework or any plans you have for, you know, shaping the access or planning for them to have access only at certain times, I would definitely be upfront with them that that's part of the plan. And I would work with them as much as possible to come up with the plan, maybe not in a democratic way where they have an equal say to you, but you could talk to them and say, well, when do you think it, it makes sense for you to have the phone in relation to homework? What about bedtime? And a lot of times kids will come up with a pretty sensible schedule for their access. You know what? That's a good point because I think you really had to have that conversation if you have older siblings in the household. So maybe there's a 15 and 16 year old, and you're talking to an eight year old. That 15, 16 year old, they may be at a maturity standpoint where they can have more access, more screen time. And of course, eight years going to want to follow, you know, suit, and they're going to want to have the same amount of access. And I think you're right. You have to kind of draw those lines before the phone is purchased. Say, look, you know, based upon your age and your maturity level. This is going to be the rules of you having a cell phone in this house. Absolutely. And then you want to look at your own use, too, and say, wow, do I want to model for my kids, you know, sleeping with the phone, having 24-7 access to the phone? Maybe I want to model that we have a station where we all put the phones away some of the time. And that then becomes an easier line to hold with the kids. I mean, even with your 16-year-old, you may not want them, you know, constantly connected. That's true. Now, once they get these phones to kids, what skill sets are vital for them to have in order to be good digital citizens? It's really crucial that you think about their social and emotional skills. So thinking about, you know, for example, discretion, does your child know the difference between my news to share and someone else's news, someone else's news to share, you know, what's okay to share with a wider group or what's something that should only be talked about with one person. And if something is truly private, 
it's great for kids to know that digital communication isn't ideal, right? So whether it's a text and someone else could screenshot it or whether it's social media, something's really private. Your best bet is a face-to-face conversation. So discretion is huge. Impulse control is huge. And most kids and even adults, you know, have moments where their impulse control isn't great. But if a child is super impulsive and they really struggle to contain impulses or they blow up really easily, then that's a kid who probably needs a lot of support if they're going to have their own device or you may want to really ramp up very slowly to getting that device, give them lots of opportunities to use a family device in a shared way where you can really mentor them and work with them. Other kids are not impulsive, but they have a hard time with boundaries, you know, just turning it off and going to bed. So with those kids, you know, you can anticipate those kinds of issues. Uh, For all kids, it's a very important, really a cornerstone idea for for me and in my work uh, with with kids and families on these issues is just empathy, remembering that there's someone else on the other end of these communications and they're going to have feelings. So if I take a picture with my three best friends at the beach and our fourth friend isn't there and I tag everybody, you know, that fourth friend might feel pretty sad. Um, or if I badmouth someone in a group text and it ends up getting shared with them, they're going to be pretty upset with me. So just remembering that empathy is a is a crucial skill set and to ask ourselves, how would I feel if I saw someone else posting this or sharing this or texting this? You talk a lot about that in your book, Screen Wise, how empathy is so important for families uh, and important for them to teach their kids when it comes to being online. Absolutely. And it's it's honestly, it's something I see adults, you know, doing better and worse all the time as well. There are a lot of times where I'm on parenting listers and we see adults, you know, kind of failing to remember <laughs> be kind to one another or think about another person's point of view. Conflict resolution is even another skill that I think that most adults have more experience with than our kids, but it's something we can really help our kids with. And, you know, if you're in a jam with someone or you don't agree with someone, maybe online isn't the best place to even get into that. Sometimes you want to talk to them in person. If you're already in a conflict online, like you've started to have kind of an argument via text message, it's great to see if you can see someone in person. And these are things I wouldn't expect kids to be all the way there, like to have a master's degree in this stuff before they get a phone. Right. But if they're really struggling with one of these areas, like if you have a kid who really struggles with conflict or really struggles with discretion or really struggles with boundaries, I would expect that that's going to be more difficult, really exacerbated by adding a personal device to the mix. So you have to know your child. Some kids might really struggle with distraction, but they're really great on empathy. Other kids are you know, really good with conflicts, but maybe they struggle in another area. So all of us, you know, have strengths and and challenges. Um, But it's really good to think about where your kid might, what the pitfalls for your child might be with a personal device. And I think that's key, because especially when it comes to stuff like sexting and cyberbullying, even if your kids may not be the ones who are partaking in those types of situations, the fact is that they're going to know somebody who's going to be a part of sexting. Somebody's going to be a part of super cyberbullying and more than likely it's going to show up on a feed of theirs on one of their social media sites. And I think it's extremely, extremely important of how they deal with that because, you know, we've seen cases. I know I've seen cases in the work that I do where I've had parents that was ready to file charges, not on the person who posted uh, inappropriate content, but also the people who commented on those posts. So she mm-hmm. was going legally after the person who posted it and every child that come in on the post she was in the process of filing charges against all of those kids. And I think sometimes as parents will say, well, you know, our kid would never cyber bully. Our kid would never sex someone. But the fact that they may be receiving those comments or those pictures and they're commenting could put them in danger as well. And I think we have to make sure we have those conversations up front, you know, before we even purchase the phone to make sure they don't go down that road. Absolutely. Just knowing that you can be accountable for something, even if you didn't say, the, you know, ugly thing or the mean thing, but maybe you're just part of a longer conversation. And that's why we need to teach kids when kids are younger, uh, you know, a young cell phone user, a fifth grader, sixth grader, it's very acceptable for them socially to use your you as an excuse, use the parents as an excuse. And that's a great way to get out of a situation. Just say, you know, if you're a fifth grader, you can just say, my dad looks at my phone, I've got to bounce out of this conversation, because it's going in a bad direction. Or just I've got to go, I will get in trouble for this. Now, a ninth grader is not going to say to her friends, I've got to go because my dad looks at my phone. And it may not be really relevant for most parents of ninth graders to sort of regularly be reading their texts. But it's great to tell your kids they can use you as an, an out for a conversation that's getting to going in a negative direction. Even if you're not looking at their text all the time, you don't have to see the conversation for your child to 
put their friends on notice. And that's a good reminder for all those kids that, hey, some adults could be looking at this. Sure, and that's an excellent point. And that's an excellent strategy for young kids to use, hey, my parents are watching my social media, or hey, my parents have an app monitoring my phone, which is a quick way to get out. And I think for those older kids, maybe a different conversation, maybe a conversation of, hey, don't post this because you could get suspended from school, or you may get expelled from school, or this could hurt your chance getting a job. I mean, I think it'd be more of them trying to help out their friend who's posted something stupid on the internet. Right, right. Or just you're being a jerk. Stop it. You know, right. like I'm taking the moral high ground here. Right. And I think the older you are, the less cool it is to just be unkind. Like by high school, a lot of kids will actually really choose the the nice kids. Um, and they're they're less interested in someone who would be mean or negative. But in middle school, I don't want to generalize, there are a lot of very kind middle schoolers, but in middle school, it is a way that a lot of children will experiment with their social power yes. is to be unkind to other kids. And kids might find that they admire that or think that that's cool in the moment. Whereas, you know, by sophomore or junior year of high school, someone who's just being mean to other kids on a text message is not going to be an appealing friend. And so there's a lot of things you can do as an adult. Frequently, I just get out of conversations that are negative. If I'm in a Facebook you know, chat and people are being negative. I'll just leave. I don't necessarily need to be like, hey, you guys are being jerks. <laughs> we just go. Um, but I, I think it's good for kids to know all of those options and to know when something is such a red alert that they need to notify an adult too, which is, you know, in like the cases you mentioned, like cyberbullying or someone talking about self-harm or violence, then it's good for kids of any age to know that that's not something they can handle on their own. I think you're right. You touched on something really important when you talked about like the middle school kids having cell phones and trying to be popular. I think the term for that is called social capital for parents that are out there. So basically it's the concept. These kids are going to have these phones. If they see something negative and they're negative with the negative things that are out there, then they may get likes. They may get shares from that. They may get props at school then they're like riding a wave of popularity. So, you know, the more negative they are, the more popular they are in front of some of the peers at their school. And this is how kids kind of gain that social capital in middle school to kind of define themselves, define their coolness. It's really, I think, important that as parents, we kind of talk to them about how that's not cool and how that can be really dangerous. Absolutely. And then the, the flip side is if you do see kids being jerks, you know, before you panic, don't freak out a certain amount of, of, of really kind of unfortunately, like not nice chat is pretty typical. So if your kid says, well, I've resolved it, you know, I worked it out, they may have worked it out. So in, unless I mean, if you see a constant stream directed at your child as something negative, I would still be concerned, even if they're telling you everything's OK. But if you see more of a back and forth, you know, where kids are being mutually aggressive and then your child's like, yeah, we worked it out. Like now we're friends again. I wouldn't hold I wouldn't take what you saw and hold on to it because a lot of times we see our child's friends maybe at their worst. Uh, but if we can also see them rise above and overcome those negative behaviors, we don't want to just hold on. And this is where texting and, and, and looking at kids texts can give us windows like you might find out your sixth graders best friend has a real potty mouth right. online and you didn't really want to know that. But when you see him, you know, in the community at baseball or at church, he's totally appropriate. So it's like, oh, wow, I know that about this kid. But you might want to try to let it go. <laughs> so do you recommend that, like, you know, maybe that first year that parents, like, stall, like, some type of monitoring app on the phone? You know how, like, Sprint Verizon, they have their own little monitoring, you know, apps and plans that they promote? Or do you think it's just best for, you know, parents to just check in maybe weekly or do spot checks on the phone and to kind of look at the conversations that are taking place on social media and different apps. I think we always want to mentor more than we monitor. What I worry about with those apps is that parents will feel like they put on the app. So everything's great. And there's yes. a lot that can get, go right past those apps where it's not, you know, a bad word or anything in particular, but that you still might want to know about. So the more important thing is that you're in close contact with your child and that you're really observing their behavior, their friendships, their relationships, their sleep, like how are they doing and not as much to, you know, you don't want to rely on one of those apps. If you're going to use an app, I'm very strongly believe you should disclose to your children that you can see their texts and their posts because covertly spying on your kids puts you in this very awkward situation as a parent. Cause then if you see something that concerns you, you don't have a very easy conversation in front of you. Whereas if your kids know you're there, they can, A, they can modify their behavior and improve it because they know you're watching. And B, 
you, you can say to them, I saw this or that that concerned me. Can you explain what's going on or tell me what's happening? As much as possible, we should resist panicking, you know, freaking out, judging, uh, especially at this age, because kids do a lot of silly things. And we also want them to be able to come to us if they really are in a jam. So I would say, you know, it's really up to you if you want to monitor your kids, but mentoring is not optional. I think a monitoring app is optional. And I think there are other ways to achieve what people hope to achieve with those apps. I think the, the, the families that use, you know, routers to schedule the whole family, I think that I've seen that be really successful. A lot of parents love those routers and feel really happy that they don't have to kind of go around to each of their kids and say, is your device off? Is your device off? Because they've shut down the, the Wi-Fi or other things. And again, I would use what you learn from those apps, though, and from seeing what your kids are doing online and how they're spending time in a way that's informational and informative and talk to kids like, oh, it seems like maybe it's not working out to have access to games when you're doing homework. It seems like it's taking more time and let's problem solve that together as opposed to going all NSA on your kid, you know, and, and just using that data in a, in a way to kind of catch them doing the wrong thing. What we want is to help our kids do the right thing. And to get them to the point where they're going to be able to self-regulate. And they'll never learn that if all we do is monitor them. Yeah, I think mentoring is important. Like, one, we want to set the right uh, role modeling for our kids ourselves. We want to do what's appropriate in our digital lives when we're on different social media sites or when we're on different apps. And I also think it's really important about the other kids and young adults around their child's ecology. For example, if it's an older sibling, if it's an older cousin that's in college, maybe there's a younger uncle uh, that's in their 20s or whatever, we got to make sure that they're doing the appropriate things as well because their behavior can also like impact the, our kids' behavior in our household if the family's not tight, if that peer circle is not tight with their digital citizenship as well. Absolutely, and I think those younger family members can be a huge asset to parents. Like I talk to parents all the time who feel like, oh, I'm barely online, it's not my thing. But I'm like, well, if you have a niece or a nephew who is an older admired cousin who you think is at least arrived at some, you know, semblance of good decision making, you know, at least they're not 12 anymore. So they can probably have some judgment, you know, that's great, because then they can be connected with your child on social media. I mean, I would watch out for that, like if they're in college, and they're going to post a lot of pictures of themselves drinking or pictures that are too sexy, then I wouldn't want my kid to be connected with them. But if they're, you know, 25 and at their first job and making a great impression, and they also happen to be on Snapchat 24 seven, and you aren't, they could be a great person for your kid to be connected with. And that's a kind of a soft supervision. But it's also someone who actually loves and has an investment in your child as a human being and knows them and knows when something seems really off or when something might be worrisome, where, you know, it's really hard for an app to understand your child. Uh, We're just not there yet with artificial intelligence, right? So they're looking for really, really, really kind of crude symptoms that something may be wrong. Um, or an app can certainly, you know, you can block porn on your kid's phone. You can do certain things with those apps. They're, they are, they have some power, but you know, that cousin or that um, sibling or that, that other person might be able to tell oh, that this, this is just a funny thing that your child is posting or, Oh, this seems kind of serious. Are they okay? I might just call them up and say, Hey, are you okay? You know, and that's what you want. You want to follow up any concern with a conversation and really find out what's happening. I think the other concern with apps is that it makes us lazy as parents. Because usually when you install them, you kind of forget about them. It's kind of like, mm-hmm. okay, if I feel that something's up, I can always go back to the app. And, and parents never go back or they never update it. So it kind of like gives you this false sense of security when you install the apps or even the routers for that much. So it's always better to have that mentor and you be that mentor so you, you're fresh and you stand on top of what's taking place from day to day. And if you're going to look at their stuff, it's also great to look at it with them because they might be able to give you some context. Like if you see kids talking negatively about one another in a a group text, you could talk to your kid about it, look at it with them and say, well, how did you feel when this was happening? Do you think this crossed the line? Get their discernment about what other people are doing uh, before you rush to judgment, because that's going to, again, tell you more than just reading it on your own and really panicking. And one of the things I want to ask you, Devorah, is about your new course to sell phone boot camp for parents. And in your course description, you highlight how parents need to organize the physical space in their home to make sure that they have positive outcomes uh, with their child's cell phone. Were you alluding to, you know, making sure that you have maybe certain sites where they have to put the cell phones at night? Or were you looking at something a little bit different? 
Yeah, I'm thinking about where these phones live in your house and also especially thinking about their bedrooms and do you want phones in the bedrooms or not. And I think that's such a crucial thing to think through, right? If you decide not to have phones in the bedrooms, and especially for young kids, but really for kids you know, of any age that are living at home, but certainly for these young kids that we're talking about, elementary and middle school kids, it's hard to see the benefit of um, a connected device living in their room overnight. It seems like there's a lot more downsides than upsides. But that's something you, again, want to plan before they suddenly say, oh, well, I need it to be my alarm clock. Well, gosh, the, you know, Lego alarm clock we, we bought you, you know, when you were younger, maybe you, you know, maybe you want to, maybe you want something cooler than that. Maybe you feel you've outgrown that. But any family that can afford to put their kid on their smartphone plan can afford to go to Target and get them an alarm clock. I hate this so much for my, my, my 12-year-old son. That's funny. Absolutely. And, and, you know, it is truly their everything. You know, it is their diary. It is their calendar. I, I get that because my phone plays that role in my life, too. And that's another thing we can do. And I'll talk about that in the boot camp as well as these practical skills like calendaring and keep it, sharing your events with other people in the family or other people that you are responsible for. These are huge skills, like the way we use our phones. A lot of it is to make plans and keep track of our lives. And that's something we can teach our kids to do. Uh, but we shouldn't expect that they're automatically going to know how to do that. Very few kids, uh, you know, are just going to intuitively pick up calendaring. But, you know, it, it's such a great s- skill set that nobody ever talks about. It's like we always think of the phone as a communication piece between us and our kids, maybe a, a safety piece or where we can contact them. When we think, you know, they're somewhere they shouldn't be. But not about skill building, like, for example, calendaring, like you said, like teaching them how to set up a calendar on their phone, how to be efficient with that calendar, how to set up alerts, how to set up different triggers during the day to make sure that you are more productive. Those are skill sets that just miss by everyone when it comes to giving these kids these cell phones. That makes sense. Now, one of the things that you talk about um, in your course is about sometimes a power struggle that comes with kids having cell phones. Now, are you talking about maybe the struggle when you have to take the cell phone away as a consequence that may be a concern? I'm thinking more even in terms of planning, like say you're going to an event with your child and your expectation in your mind is, of course, my kid wouldn't have their phone out during, you know, a bar mitzvah or, you know, grandma's birthday. But in their mind, it's a perfectly fine time. So as much as possible, I would preempt the power struggle in the moment when it's public and more difficult uh, to having a plan and even like looking at the calendar and looking at during the week and saying, hmm, like, let's see, you're going to go to this and this and this. And these are probably times to leave the phone at home or this is unplugged or turn it off. And these are other times where it's fine to have it out and make a plan with them for when they're going to be using their phone. And similarly, if you have a schedule, like some kids, for example, maybe they can't text after nine o'clock. Well, that's a great thing for them to know, but if you can remind them that it's also good to share that boundary with their friends because they'll have less connectivity, anxiety, and then it's less of a power struggle for you to be reminding them at nine because they've already told their friends this is already part of what people know about them. So it's less of an issue in the moment of like, okay, it's nine o'clock. You've already made that plan. Now, if you just walk up to your kid who's in the middle of a group text at nine o'clock and say, turn it off, put it away, that's going to be a power struggle. Now you'll win because you're the parent, but right. it's a, it's a less, less productive, you know, nobody really wants to be in the middle of those power struggles all the time. Now, do you suggest in your camp uh, parents like writing some type of cell phone contract prior to purchasing the phone? We are going to work on contracts for people who want to, but if you don't want to do a contract, like if, if you've never done that kind of thing with your kid, it's not your style. I think there are other ways. Like I, what I'm going to do with people in the, in the boot camp is we're going to write a plan. And for some people, their plan is going to include a contract. And for other people, it's more like a series of conversations, but that there are a series of crucial conversations that I'm going to lead people through that. I think, you know, everyone must talk with kids about and ask kids. It's not a, it's not the lecture. It's not like I'm going to lecture kids about being a good friend online. I'm going to ask them some questions and make sure I know kind of what's going on in their community. So Devore, like one last question, what skills and value would parents receive from taking this boot camp course? That's a great question. I think parents will feel a lot calmer and more prepared for their child to have a phone. And I think there'll also be some people in the class who maybe are in the first year with a phone that they already got a phone and then they're having that oh, moment of, you know, uh-huh. and, and they'll just recognize these are the skills that I really need to talk with kids about. And they'll be able to be much more intentional 
in getting their child ready or mentoring them on those skills. So they'll have an individual plan. I don't believe that there's a one size fits all plan so that it is a self study course where some of the things they'll do during the week are, you know, during the four weeks are go talk to your kid about this or get on the same page with your spouse about that. Or if you're already, um, if your child already has a phone, look at some of the problems that have come up and think about what's one problem you really want to focus on and, and, and change. Right. So, I think people will feel a lot calmer and more in control and like they can anticipate some of the challenges that will come up. I cannot guarantee that there will be no surprises or that it will all be smooth sailing. There'll be still challenges even for people who take my course. Right. So it's not the kind of course where it's like, well, I've solved all your problems. But I do believe that parents will be a lot more prepared and that they'll even be able to mentor some of their friends as, you know, as their friends get their kids phones. They'll be able to turn to the parents who've taken my course and say, OK, what should I be thinking about? And I definitely co-sign this course. And if parents, if you are out there, you're just scared to death about buying that cell phone this summer for next school year. You have all these worries and these fears. I would definitely say, you know, go to Devora's site, get the course. Also get her book Screenwise, where she really talks to you about getting these these really soft core skills like empathy that you can teach your kids. Because once you teach your kids these skill sets, then the less monitoring and mentoring you really have to do on the back end because they'll know what to do when they get things in real time in their real life. So, Devora, where should they go to purchase the course? So the the landing page is raisingdigitalnatives.com backslash cell phone boot camp. And if you can't find it for whatever reason, you can just write to me um, at raisingdigitalnatives.com. Go to the contact me and say, hey, where's that? Where's that course? <laughs> What's going on? And I'll I'll direct you there. But it's cell phone boot camp after raisingdigitalnatives.com. And when does the camp start? Uh, in early July. We're going to go for four weeks. But even if folks have travel plans or other things, I'm going to record all the calls. And a lot of the other pieces are things that you do on your own and readings on to watch on your own and videos and other things. So it's, you, you don't have to be, you know, you don't have to cancel your plans to go camping or anything to take the course. <laughs> well, listen, Devor, we appreciate it. We're glad that you were able to join the show today. Thank you so much. It's always great to talk with you. Hey guys, I hope you really enjoyed the episode with Devor talking about appropriate cell phone use. I really recommend that you go and get her course her new cell phone boot camps for parents because getting your kid a cell phone is just like giving your kid a car. You know, you don't just give a kid a car. They have to go through certain tests to get a license, learns permit. It's the same thing with a cell phone. We just can't give them a cell phone, tell them what not to do. They have to be trained. They have to be taught. They have to be kind of guided. And the thing I love about the course is that Devora, with all her expertise, really breaks that down and gives it to you in a week seminar with all these different videos and all these different skill set that you can sit down that you can take with your child. And when you give them that cell phone, you will have a peace of mind. So make sure you go to her site, raisingdigitalnatives.com backslash cell phone bootcamp. Now, if you need it and more specifically, you can go to the show notes and there will be a link in the show notes that will take you directly to the site. Also, make sure you go to the show notes and go to our new Udemy course on how to use Twitter to land scholarships. They can really position your child right now in middle school and high school to get a scholarship and to get into the school of their dreams. And as usual, make sure you go to iTunes and rate this podcast. Let us know what you thought about this interview with Devora. Until the next time.